Hi and welcome. Thank you very much for tuning in to my live stream for my all baseball song show today. It's a good thing we're playing indoors today because it's pouring outside like crazy. Let me adjust my chair. This is also my very first home game. I've done other baseball shows in the past, but I was always on the road, so I wore the road uniform. But today I get to wear the home jersey. I'm going to start off with the very first baseball song I ever wrote. It's called Lefty. our leadoff batter, Lefty. Before I introduce uh, the second man up, I'd like to introduce you to our umpire today, Barbie Angel. That's with two L's. She is our digital concierge today. She'll be calling balls and strikes, calling outs, and dropping URLs hopefully into the comments if YouTube will let her. Um, letting you know about the tip jar and where you can get my recordings. Um, I'm playing mostly songs today from the Baseball Ballads Volume 1 and the Baseball Ballads Volume 2 and some newer baseball songs as well. Um, this one here is the second baseball song that I ever wrote. It's called The Ballad of Eddie Clapp. And Eddie Clapp was the first white man to ever play in the Negro Leagues, the same year that Jackie Robinson first played for the Dodgers. Eddie Klepp was a pitcher, and he pitched a few games for the Cleveland Buckeyes in the, uh, in the Negro Leagues. Here's a photo of Eddie Klepp. Mm -hmm. 
Betting Second, a ballad of Eddie Clapp. chance to visit Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama, where um, Eddie Klepp was banned from playing with his team. Um, that stadium still exists. It, if it's not the oldest ballpark in all of the United States, it's the second or third, but I believe it may be the very oldest. And that was quite an experience. It's still there. Um, it's not used very often, but it's still there. You can, you can visit it. I had somebody... Um, Several years back, give me a gift at one of my shows that was really amazing. It was these two tickets from a game in Eastman, Georgia. And the reason these tickets are so unique is because the stadium in Eastman, Georgia was the only stadium in the United States that um, actually printed the words colored seating on the, on the tickets. Everywhere else it was just known which sections were for African Americans only. But in Eastman, Georgia, they printed it on the ticket. So this next song is for any Cub fans out there. Um, I have a song that I have since uh, recently retired, uh, a few years back, called The Curse of the Billy Goat, because I've replaced it with a newer song. Batting third from Chicago, the funeral for the curse.
a week with two Wednesdays. Hadn't happened since 1908. Red snowflakes were falling. It was a very blue moon. And all the folks in Chicago were singing a Steve Goodman tune. on all the bases and that brings up our cleanup hitter which today is Letters in the Dirt and that's a song I wrote for my dad it's a song about my favorite baseball player of all time a man by the name of Dick Allen who when I was a kid was known as Richie Allen and in my song because it's set in the 1960s I refer to him as Richie Allen and Richie Allen was Philly's best player at the time. He was the rookie of the year in the National League in 1964. The year before that, he played for the Phillies Farm Club in Little Rock, Arkansas, where he became the first African-American player to cross Arkansas's color line 16 years after Jackie Robinson. And you can probably imagine what kind of abuse he was subjected to in Little Rock. We all remember those infamous Luncheonette counter stories. I know of a funny one. There was a, uh, a uh, former Major League Baseball player from Cuba. I can't think of his name right now, but he walked into a luncheonette in Little Rock, and they said, we don't serve colored people. And he said, I don't eat colored people. I want rice and beans. So Richie Allen was a superstar, and Philadelphia fans weren't really ready for an African-American superstar in the 1960s, or one that was so well paid. He also had a habit of getting himself in a little bit of trouble, which probably 
would not be so much the case today, but back in the 60s, African-American ballplayers were expected to keep their mouths shut, keep their heads down, play ball, be seen but not heard, and that's just not who he was. He was a human being. He is a human being. And so uh, the fans would boo Richie Allen every time he came to bat. And I didn't understand this at, as a kid. My dad always taught me you root for the home team, and it wasn't until I was an adult and had a chance to read through Richie Allen's file at the Baseball Hall of Fame that I learned about some of the racist incidents of the day. But I do remember how, at the time, when he was being booed, he never made an obscene gesture back at the fans. He waited until the Phillies were out in the field on defense, and after a couple of position changes, he settled in at first base. And in between pitches, when he was in the field, he would write words with his shoes in the dirt and spell out the word boo, great big letters, right back at the fan. He would write other things, too. Um, one day he wrote um, boo in the dirt, and the commissioner of baseball was there, and he sent word down to the Phillies manager, Gene Mock, tell Richie Allen to stop writing words in the dirt. And the next inning, Richie Allen ran out there and wrote no. So this is from a dad. never booed Richie Allen And I never understood why people did If he had a homer every time he stepped up to the plate That's what I remember as a kid Richie in the field out there by first base Target of some mighty foul words With his shoes he'd scrawl between the pitches Boo, great big letters in the dirt Well, Philly fans, they've been known to get nasty When Joe must go, they run him out of town Saw Santa get hit by a snowball, then get hit again when he was down. Well, me and you, we never boo Richie Allen, even if he did sometimes strike out. I was too young to read the papers. That booing was about. Well, that big collapse of '64, it was ugly. They blew a lead of six in one half games with 12 to play. Some might say their fans were justifiably angry. World Series tickets printed up in vain. Got one. Print it up in vain. Philly fans, they better know to get nasty. When Joe must go, they run him out of town. I saw Santa get hit by a snowball, then get hit again when he was down. and the privilege of meeting Mr. Dick Allen in person about almost 20 years ago now, I suppose. I'd been invited by the Baseball Hall of Fame to come out to Cooperstown and do a concert there of my baseball songs, and I was tipped off to the fact that Dick Allen happened to be in Philadelphia, uh, I'm sorry, happened to be in Cooperstown at the same time I was, and if you like irony, you'll appreciate the fact that he now works for the Philadelphia Phillies in public relations, and he was out there on some kind of baseball business, and I was told my friend, a former director of research at the Hall of Fame, Mr. Tim Wiles, that most likely he'd be staying at the Otisaga Hotel. And Tim suggested I take a drive over there and see if I could leave a copy of the CD for him at the front desk. So I did that, and when I walked in the lobby door to my absolute and utter astonishment, there was Dick Allen himself in the lobby. 
lobby having a conversation with someone else. So I just waited until they were finished. And I approached him and I introduced myself and told him I'd grown up watching him play in Philadelphia and he's my favorite player of all time and that I'd written a song. Gave him the CD and he was pretty taken aback by this, I have to say. He was kind of looking down at it and up at me, down at it and up at me, sizing me up, you know, like anybody would do if somebody walked up to you out of the blue and said, hey man, I wrote a song about you here. But it dawned on me in that moment that there was a photo in the booklet that would, might be kind of fun to show him in person. A photo of the word boo in the dirt that we had composed for the CD booklet. So I asked for the CD back for a second and I took the shrink wrap off and showed him this photograph and I was hoping I'd get a little reaction from him but I was not at all prepared for the tear that I saw roll down his cheek. This was before the days of the million dollar contracts And before the days of the artificial grass He stood a bit outside the lines Which made him fair game for those times Cause Richie Allen, he never kissed the white man's ass Well me and you, we never booed Richie Allen now we'd pound our mitts and we'd yell, we want to hit. How could they call a guy a bum after he just hit a home run? Well, that didn't make any sense to a kid. But I since found out all these years later, now I know a lot more than I did. Back then you knew, Daddy, why all those other people booed. Thanks for letting me have my heroes as a kid. Letters in the Dirt. And here is a Richie Allen baseball card. I think my friend Chip Raymond gave me this one. I know he gave me this. This is a bona fide 1964 World Series ticket printed prematurely because the Phillies did not make it to the World Series. This next song, Batting Fifth, was written from a photograph that I saw. I saw it on Facebook. It was the day that a former Major League Baseball player by the name of George Shotgun Shuba passed away. So it was just maybe five years ago or so. And this is the photograph that was posted. And this was one of the most powerful photographs I've ever seen. Because that was from Jackie Robinson's very first game playing with the Whites. He was playing for the Dodgers, Brooklyn Dodgers Farm Club, the Montreal Royals. They had a game in Jersey City, New Jersey against the Giants. Jackie Robinson went four for five that day, and one of his hits was a home run. That one there in the photo. And as he approached home plate, George Shuba, who was the batter on deck, stood there waiting for him with his hand extended and a big smile on his face. And they had a handshake. And this was an incredibly profound moment in baseball history because, as everybody out there is aware, um, there were many people on Jackie Robinson's own team that did not want to play on the same field with him. So this was a very spontaneous gesture. It was not thought through. George Shuba could have had no idea Jackie Robinson was going to hit a home run. But uh, that photograph spoke volumes to me. And I turned it into the song called The Handshake. Casting 
long shadows as they touched every base and as he rounded the third one the sun lit up his face it was only a handshake well maybe not quite it was captured on camera in black and white of them smiling as he touches the plate as he crosses the line when he knows that he's safe it was only a handshake on opening day no one knew what would happen if the fella could play it was only and cursed It's only a handshake on a minor league field And it wasn't until later it became a big deal It's just something that happened It was nothing he planned The guy hit a homer So he stuck out his hand between men teammate to teammate that's all it was then he stood there to greet him he could have waited on deck it was only a handshake but he showed him respect it was only a handshake the handshake in the in the number five hole before I introduce you to the song batting sixth today I want to mention a couple of things um, there are a couple of digital tip jars and I really have no idea because I can't read the comments while I play so I don't know if Barbie is successfully able to drop those URLs into the chat window because last week she was prevented from doing that for some strange reason we don't know so I put them in there at the very beginning of this show, and if that's something you'd like to do, make a contribution to the tip jar, I would really appreciate it. This is my only way of making a living these days, and um, you can either scroll through the chat window to the very beginning of the show, or you can wait till the end on the, uh, the photo that I use for the post-show photo. It's got all of those URLs up there as well. Um, besides the digital tip jars, I would also like to encourage you to become my patron at patreon.com. I have a site there, and I post things there that I don't share with anybody else but my patrons. Uh, brand new songs that maybe aren't quite ready to be heard by the masses. Um, or songs in progress, or photos and stories that I think might interest you as my patron. But you'll have exclusive access to lots of different stuff like that, private Zoom concerts for my patrons, and, and fun things. But you can, uh, you can make a pledge. It's, it's a way of supporting me on a monthly, steady basis. So you can make a pledge as low as a dollar a month or as high as you would like to. And all of my patrons at each level have equal access to everything that I put up there. Because I don't really believe that if you have more money and can afford to pledge more, you should that should buy you uh, more privileges. Not in my world. So 
everybody, um, everybody that wants to become a patron, even for a dollar, you'll have access to everything. But it's a way of giving me a little bit of comfort and security, knowing that every month I'm going to have a certain amount of money coming in, especially these days, because my, my entire tour schedule has been canceled through the end of the year and most likely much, much further than that. But at least we can live stream and we can hang out like this. If you're interested in having me play a private Zoom concert for you and your friends and family, you can contact me um, either through Facebook or chuck at chuckbrodsky.com, my email address. I'll do it over my Zoom account. Um, my recordings, if you want actual CDs, you can get them from chuckbrodsky.com. And if you want um, digital downloads, you can go to Bandcamp. I think it's chuckbrodsky.bandcamp. Dot com, but you can if, if that doesn't work and Barbie's not able to put in the URLs and you can't find them anywhere, you can just go to Bandcamp and search for Chuck Brodsky. So that's all I can think of to say right now. Um, I'd love to know where you're watching from. If you could put that in the comments, that's always fun. And if you have any requests for future weeks, I'd love to know what they are. And again, I appreciate you very much watching today um, our hitter in the number six slot is a uh, former umpire by the name of Jim Joyce and Jim Joyce unfortunately made one of the worst calls in the history of baseball he was the first base umpire the day that Armando Galarraga had pitched eight and two-thirds innings of perfect baseball had not given up a hit had not walked anybody nobody had reached base at all from the other team and on this blown play there was a an infield hit and the pitcher had to cover first base and he caught the throw with his foot on the bag in plenty of time the runner should have been called out Jim Joyce called him safe he saw it differently and unfortunately they were not using instant replay then to overturn calls they were using it. Uh, everybody watching on TV saw that he had blown this call. But it wasn't until after the game Jim Joyce saw the replay um, in the locker room, and he was absolutely beside himself. He understood the gravity of the situation, and he did an amazing thing. He sent word to the Detroit Tigers locker room that he would really like it if Armando Galarraga could stop by the umpire's dressing room so that he could personally apologize to him. And after that, he faced the press. And he stood up like a man and said, I blew the call. The next day, Jim Joyce was the home plate umpire. And instead of the manager coming out to hand him the lineup card, the manager sent Armando Galarraga to hand it to him. And they had a big embrace at home plate. And a uh, little postscript to that. I just learned uh, a week or so ago that just a few weeks after that horrible blown call, Jim Joyce was entering a ballpark to work another game. And on his way in, he saw a woman collapse, and he revived her with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and saved her life just three or four weeks after that blown call. I had a chance to speak with Jim Joyce, and I sent him this song. This is called Stand Up Guy. Jim Joyce, he's a stand up guy. Listen to me, and I'll tell you why. He made a mistake, and it made him cry, and he didn't go fishing for an alibi. Jim Joyce, stand up guy. Pitcher was thrown a perfect game, but the first two outs of the Ball was hit, he won the race He caught the throw with his foot on the base Jim Joyce, stand-up guy Just called the batter safe at first A putrid call, the all-time worst The travesty, the guy was out The replay showed beyond a doubt Jim Joyce, stand-up guy and With half a smile to mask his grief Pitcher stood in disbelief he Never lost his dignity His eyes though said, you're kidding me Joyce, stand up guy. There still was one more out to get. The game it 
wasn't over yet. It should have been. You caught the throw. Plenty of time, but there you go. Jim Joyce, stand up guy. In the locker room, Joyce watched the tape. Left them all bent out of shape. Sat a while alone, distressed outside the door of the bloodthirsty press. Jim Joyce, stand up guy. Well, I cost that kid a perfect game. He stood up sobbing and took the blame. I was convinced of what I saw. I just missed the bleeping call. Jim Joyce, stand up guy. Well, nobody's perfect, the pitcher would say in an interview. The very next day, he's only human. He made a mistake. Everybody will cut him a break, Jim Joyce, stand-up guy. Yeah, Jim Joyce, he's a stand-up guy. He called for the pitcher to please come by. Face to face, apologize. Jim Joyce's tears were Texas-sized. Jim Joyce, stand-up guy. seventh today. Hmm, maybe he should have been batting fourth. Babe Ruth. Mr. Babe Ruth. Now, there's no way I could write a single song about Babe Ruth. I mean, I've been known to write some long songs, but a song about Babe Ruth would be about three or four days long. I'm sure of it. So I focused on one little aspect. Since I live in Asheville, North Carolina, when I heard about this story, it really resonated with me. The New York Yankees, after they'd finished spring training every year, they would play their way back to New York, and they would make stops. The train would stop in different towns that maybe had minor league teams or maybe didn't have any baseball at all. So this was a chance for fans who never got a chance to see major league players to see them. And on one such trip back to New York when they stopped in Asheville, North Carolina. Babe Ruth had not been feeling so well for several weeks. And when they stopped in Asheville, Babe Ruth collapsed. And a newspaper in London, England, caught word of this, but they thought that Babe Ruth had died, and so they printed as the headline, Babe Ruth died in Asheville, North Carolina. Well, this was picked up on the wires. And newspapers all around the world ran the story. Babe Ruth died in Asheville, North Carolina. He did call our ballpark here, McCormick Field, which was which opened in 1924. He did call it a damn delightful place to play. And as I will attest, it's a pretty nice place to have a some ballpark food. I mean, the Asheville tourists are local single A team last couple of weekends have opened up McCormick Field as a pop-up restaurant selling ballpark food. And yesterday I went down and, and had some. It was a great experience, a lot of fun. So this is called The Bellyache Heard Round the World. Pounds to lose. He 
we'd spend the winter partying But that was never news Wasn't feeling all that well Throughout the training camp Babe would run a fever And he often had the cramps well, After leaving Florida On the way back Yankees played the Brooklyn Robins on an exhibition tour. They stopped in Chattanooga. They hit two home runs. The next night they were in Knoxville. The babe hit another one. the mountain tracks twisting and winding they've sat down to a card game his cheeks and forehead burn he really did not look so good and his teammates were concerned That's what 
it all Maybe you're needing a stretch right about now. We've completed seven innings. I think it's it's time to just stretch for a second. I'm going to shift over to the piano real quick for a song. I forgot a chair, so I'm going to have to just kneel to do this. I won. A uh, two, a uh, three. I want to play this next song for a couple of the dear friends of mine, my friend Chip, my friend Lee, and my friend Brad. And you all know who we are. The subject of this next song was um, your favorite player of all time, too. Let me get a quick adjustment on this. His name was Roberto Clemente. Batting eighth, one of the greatest baseball players of all time who tragically lost his life in an airplane crash trying to deliver humanitarian aid to Nicaragua. He had just gotten the 3,000th hit of his career, the final game of that season. He heard that all of the aid being delivered to Nicaragua, and he had already sponsored uh, a couple or a few plane loads of this aid, he found out that the Nicaraguan junta was stealing it. And so he decided he would fly with that next shipment. And unfortunately, the plane went down. And the world lost a very class human being. So this is called Roberto. Procedures they were totally ignored. The engine didn't sound right, 
said the people on the ground when it took off from Managua tried to circle back around now people still remember where they were that New Year's Eve when the word began to spread hardly anyone believed helicopters hovered all throughout the nights just above the waters sweeping with their lights well they never found Roberto but the search went on for days frantically at first till they found his leather case no one could bear to call it off so they carried on Divers never found him. Roberto, he was gone. Punto Maldonado, off the Puerto Rican coast. People sometimes stand there, looking for the ghost of the greatest baseball player they ever called their own. Went off on a mission. is our I think we're going to go into extra innings today because this is um, the ninth batter of the game and I'm not ready to stop we're tied up so we're going to have to keep on going um, this is a true story about a prison baseball team from the Wyoming State Penitentiary 1911 and 1912 and all of the players on this team were on death row they were literally playing for their lives. As long as they kept winning, they got to play another game.
Carbon County Volunteer Band Played for the people in the stands Our dark blue flannels trimmed with white They fit just fine, baggy or tight Compared to wearing prison blues They kept us off the working crews Shelf. We went 39 and 6 against the clock that always ticks. The warden bet on us to win, so did the judge, the two were friends. Our executions would be stayed depending on how well we played. Based on a true story that happened to a pitcher by the name of Brian Mazzone, a career minor league pitcher who changed teams 20 different times over the course of his career. He pitched in such places as Joliet, Illinois, Adelanto, California, Fresno, California, oh, Obregon, Mexico, Valencia, Venezuela, Allentown, Pennsylvania, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, Mexicali, Mexico. Albuquerque, New Mexico, Redding, Pennsylvania, Eugene, Oregon, St. George, Utah, and he even pitched in Korea. And at the age of 30, Philadelphia Phillies called him up for a spot start. One of their major league pitchers had a sore arm. And they called Brian up for his cup of coffee. And this is what happened that day. was orange on the radar In some places it was red Saw it on the TV He was still in bed Room service brought him breakfast Some good coffee as well Get used to staying at a major league hotel. Well, it was raining hard that morning. The whole day it would pour. We would just stare out the window from the 27th floor. Night before at supper Some joint in Buffalo Skipper called to tell him He was going to the show Text messages and emails Were lighting up his phone All his friends and family From everyone he 
you'd ever know As folks flew in from Boston His wife just made her flight They all got there the next day To see him pitch that night So he put his big league pants on And he tied his big league shoes While a couple of big leaguers Were giving interviews His name was in the lineup He was mentioned on the news in years for this It even pitched in Veracruz and So we walked out through that tunnel Stand on a big lake mound His tears mixed with the raindrops And he felt like he might drown they squeezed the big league baseball Ran his fingers along the seams The rain was cruel and stung him As it washed away his dreams And it was flooded in the dugout It was a lonely place to sit of going to Korea Or maybe it was time to quit And how next time they need a pitcher They'll probably call up some kid Every time thereafter That's exactly what they did Now that tarp was never lifted And that storm never let up It's like he got his cup of coffee Without the coffee cup They let him keep his jersey The box that's soaking wet That was as close to the major as he would ever get. Well, now you can say that's baseball, especially if you never played. But for the guy who worked his ass off and whose dues were overpaid. This was all he'd ever wanted Ever since the seventh grade Congratulations were in order But condolences were made Yeah, that tarp was never lifted And that storm never let up Like he got his cup of coffee Without the coffee cup well, Let's see what inning this is. I've lost track. Sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. We're going into the eleventh inning, folks. And uh, I'm going to do two more songs here. This one... It's a true story. There have been uh, several really incredibly strange, bizarre things that have happened in the world of baseball over the years, and I'll close with two of them. This one happened in Chicago, right in the middle of the disco era. I hated disco music. I still hate disco music. I watch disco music 
pushed the singer-songwriters right off of the uh, AM dial, right off of all the cool stations, and uh, changed the entire landscape. I have never forgiven disco for that. And apparently never did um, a man named Bill Vec, who used to own the Chicago White Sox. And Bill Vec was quite a promoter, quite a character. He was the guy that um, once signed Eddie Goodell, the midget, to bat. Um, all sorts of crazy promotions, but probably none of them ever um, were crazier than this one. Because he teamed up with the local rock and roll radio station for a special promotion during a doubleheader where anybody that brought a disco record to the ballpark could get into the game for 98 cents. And so this brought a lot of people. They, they, the stadium was packed. Way, way more people showed up than they had room for. But these were not baseball fans. So this is called Disco Demolition Night. to the 70s when disco was the rage 12 inch vinyl singles lip syncing from the stage white socks near the cellar they were mostly empty seats there was the usual sarcasm from the writers on the beat the owner of the white socks was a fella named bill Vack, master of promotions things he never would expect the guy who signed a midget and then sent him up to bat this time signed off on something even crazier than that in between games the twilight doubleheader Rock and roll DJ would blow up disco records. So if you brought an LP, dropped it in the crate, you'd only have to pay 98 cents. Mission at the gate, on the buses to the ballpark, you didn't see too many kids. Didn't see a lot of baseball caps or many baseball mitts. People had been drinking long before they paid their fares. Traffic on the freeways backed up to O'Hare. Comiskey Park, Chicago didn't have as many seats as was needed to accommodate thousands in the street. They started climbing fences, they started climbing poles. They had come to conquer in the name of rock and roll. With a slight miscalculation, they had underestimated by just how many people disco was so deeply hated. More police were needed, but nobody thought to call. The person on the sidewalk burned a John Travolta doll. than a miracle that no one was killed or maimed by disco record frisbees throughout the opening game some shattered on the dugout some knifed into the grass some numbskulls roamed around looking to kick somebody's ass well the white Sox lost the first game whether anyone noticed it or not there was trouble brewing in the air but all you could smell was pot the crowd was growing restless for the real show to begin when the grounds crew came a hauling all those disco records in the jeep the dj rode it on stopped in center field driver left the motor running, hands upon the wheel. One foot on the gas pedal and one foot on the brake. Lorelei, the supermodel, she just smiled and waved. The crowd was in a frenzy. They were yelling, disco sucks. It was very nearly rapture when they blew the records up. Sky high went to pieces, some landed in St. Paul. Most people yelled, woohoo, and then drank more alcohol. Bunch of knuckleheads jumped the outfield wall. Jeep got through it just in time before the free for all. Must have been a couple thousand of them tearing up the grass. Lighting things on fire more than half an hour passed. Bill Vecchi stood at home plate, his face as red as peats. He pleaded through the PA system, go back to your seats. The crowd began to mimic him with go back to your seats. Hey! A couple having sex at second base did not obey. Second game got forfeited because the ball field was a wreck. But disco was eradicated, partly thanks to Mr. Vet. Good riddance to the 70s.
thank you all for watching today. Really appreciate you being here with me. Um, hope you've enjoyed today's show. I'll probably do another baseball show sometime before too long. Um, opening day is this week. So may the healthiest team win. This next song, my final song, is uh, probably the craziest baseball story I have ever heard. And like I said, there's lots of them. But this was this happened um, in 1970, June 12th, 1970. A pitcher by the name of Doc Ellis with the Pittsburgh Pirates thought the team had a day off, and they did not. They had actually moved from Los Angeles to San Diego without him. He had permission to remain behind. But he thought the team had a day off, so he did what I suppose everybody who has a day off does, day off the next day does. He took LSD. He stayed up all night. In the morning, he took more. And that's when his girlfriend realized by looking at the newspaper that Doc Ellis was scheduled to pitch that, ne that night in San Diego. So they did get him there from Los Angeles. And Doc Ellis showed up just in time for the game. He went out there. He did indeed pitch. He went all nine innings. And he threw a no-hitter. This is a true story. And uh, before I sing this song, I just want to again mention those URLs, the tip, dar tip jar URLs. You can either find them in the chat uh, window, chat column. Um, if Barbie was unsuccessful dropping them in there, they, uh, they do exist right before the show started, and they will be on the final uh, screen shot at the end of the show. So appreciate it if you might throw something into the tip jar, and if you consider checking out my Patreon page, and again, any recordings that you might want, um, they're on a, the digital downloads are on a pay-what-you-want basis, so um, you can help yourselves. If you order the physical CDs, um, I'll be the one package them and take them to the post office and if you want them autographed just let me know and I'll be happy to do that for you make sure there's nothing else I wanted to tell you about if you're interested in taking songwriting lessons um, or critique having your songs critiqued or working with me online we can do that if you're interested in guitar lessons as well through zoom I'm available for that and I'm available for private zoom concerts so this song is called Doc Ellis's No-No, and before I sing it, I just want to show you a baseball card real quick. In, in this particular year, they put out a series of cards, so-and-so, various players in action. I was in college at the time. I heard about the Doc Ellis story, and I substituted the words on acid for in action. And I'll make one more quick plug here for if you enjoy these songs, they are all available. Um, either on the Baseball Ballads Volume 1, the Baseball Ballads Volume 2. A few of my baseball songs are available on... Two are available on Telltale Heart. Two are available on Them and Us. A cup of coffee has not been recorded yet, but I am headed towards a Volume 3 of the Baseball Ballads, and all of those songs that I just mentioned will eventually be on it, but if you want them now, you can get them through um, by picking up Telltale Heart and Lemon Us for those four that have been recorded already. And there's a YouTube video of Cup of Coffee if you're interested in seeing that again. Or you can watch this live stream again. Thanks again. The weather cooperated, even though we're indoors. Play ball. It was a lovely summer's morning, an off day in LA. So thought one Doc Ellis, see what later say. His girlfriend read the paper, she said, Doctors can't be right. He says here that you're pitching in San Diego tonight. Got to get you to the airport, so off Doc Ellis flew. His legs were a little bit wobbly, and the rest of him was too. Took a taxi to the ballpark, but an hour before the game, gave a half assed explanation, found the locker with his name. The organ in the upper deck, 
played all the schmaltz hits. You could hear it in the clubhouse while Doc was getting dressed. His sunglasses he reached for from his locker in a case. Doc Ellis put his jersey on and he put them on his face. Time came to go on out there, down the corridor. The walls were a little bit wavy and there were ripples in the floor. Went out to the bullpen, do a bunch of scratches. Loosen up a little, throw some more my pitches. All rose for the national anthem. People took off their hats. The fireworks were exploding and the cokes were already going flat. The doc was back there in the dugout with so many things to watch. Some players spit tobacco juice and others grabbed their crotch. And the umpire hollered, play ball, and so it came to be. The doc's pirates batted first when they went down one, two, three. The doc's catcher put his mask on and he handed Doc the ball and it was 327 feet to the left and right field wall. say about that day that it looked a little wild. Only the batter trembled and nobody knew why. Doc Ellis smiled. When you walk eight and you hit a guy, you know things that people shout. Especially the manager, but it did not take Doc out. Doc found himself a rhythm in a crazy little spin. Amazing things would happen when Doc Ellis zeroed in. Sometimes he saw the catcher, sometimes he did not. Sometimes he held a beach ball, other times it was a dot. Doc was tossing Comments that were leaving trails of glitter In the seventh inning stretch He still had his no-hitter So he turns to cash his buddy says I gotta know no going Speaking the unspeakable He goes back out there throwing Bottom of the ninth And he stood high upon the mound Three more outs to go And he'd have his name in Cooperstown was Conazaro, he flied out to a loop. Then Kelly grounded out for Dean and the shortstop field, that's two. Must have been a madhouse, fans upon their feet. Little ones among them were standing on their seats. Well, that would have brought a purple, but Specio pinch hit. And he took a third strike looking in officially, that was it. It was a lovely summer's morning, an off day in L.A. So thought one day. Thanks for being with me. Stay safe. Stay well. Hope to see you next Sunday. I'll be back for a regular show then. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye. <laughs>